there's been a lot in the media and government over the last year about how important it is to find the evidence, only to find out that whilst the phrase makes for a good soundbite, such evidence may seem counterintuitive or unpalatable and therefore it's not always acted on. After I was told the government was due to invest more in street lighting after the sad events in Clapham earlier this year, I wanted to find out what the current thinking on the relationship of when crime and street lighting was, as not everything is as clear cut as we would expect, like many things in life. Uh, today we are joined on the Light Review by some of the leaders in our industry to see if they can offer some clarity on this well-trod path. In this podcast for the Light Review, we are joined by two experts in the field of exterior lighting, Steve Batios. Professor of Lighting and Visual Perception at the University of Sheffield, Editor of Lighting Research and Technology, and Alan Howard, Technical Director of Lighting and Energy Solutions at WSP. So welcome to you both, and thanks very much for fitting us into your very busy schedules. Actually, Alan, I had um, an interview with Sasha not so long ago. Um, I don't know if you know Sasha. He works for me. Obviously, you know Sasha. <laughs> uh, he's a very nice, very nice guy. Um, yes. And the projects you're doing is, are amazing. And Steve, I, I've heard a lot about you from Juliet and the Society of Light to Lighting. So, mm. yeah, thanks. I was saying the other day, the people that give their time to the SLL, no one really understands it's for free. And I, I can't get over the fact. So, so grateful for people, like, just basically helping out the lighting right. industry. It's crazy, isn't it? Can I, uh, can I um, support that with a statement that a lot of work in lighting for SLL, for other organisations, for CIE, is done by volunteers. We rely on it quite a lot. It's crazy, isn't it? Because the stuff that comes out, all the guides and things, they're pretty heavy stuff. I mean, it's not like yep. you can just yep. make it up. So, yeah, so that's a big shout out to everyone that's uh, putting their... Yeah. Definitely. Stick in. Um, it's, it's, nice, it's nice to do. Um, I mean, I'm working on some CIE stuff at the moment, some ILP things as well, and it, it's just um, find it fascinating to understand different facets of light and lighting. It's a good way to build a community, and that's what we should have, isn't it? A lighting community. I think we do have that. Um, within oh, the no, no, we have a lighting community. Nobody comes into lighting because they see it as a career, but you fall into it. And <laughs> Because of the community, very rarely anybody ever leaves it. Yeah, you're right. And um, even when they find when they find out that actually, maybe it's not the path isn't laden with silver and gold. You still stick at it. And so you, there must be something very um, very appealing about these. And and you know if you you have to be really careful what you say about anyone because they're bound to find out. Um, and you probably end up working for them, to be honest. So you, I, I, maybe that breeds a, a happy culture. I don't know. Um, so I just, obviously, talking to you about following the sad events, uh, the recent sad events, the government announced it was doubling the size of the Safer Streets Fund to 45 million. So I, I just wondered, is this just a knee-jerk reaction? Um, in 2015, a CRG study found no evidence of a relationship between the count of crime and street light switch off, whilst the College of Policing in 2020 reported it could reduce burglary and theft, but not violent crime. So do we have any empirical evidence or is it even possible to ever have any empirical evidence around that by which you can make decisions on street lighting and exterior lighting? I suppose there's two questions. What do you think of the knee-jerk, well, firstly, do you think it's a knee-jerk reaction? Is it ever justified? Um, and is there any, where, where would be the best place to get the evidence from? Because there's contradictory uh, reports all the time, isn't there? So in terms of knee-jerk reaction, um, possibly, but I think that's what the government does. Um, they see votes in their response to incidents like this. So if they think they can get some votes, they will throw money at anything. That's my opinion. Uh, Another way of looking at it is what they've done is provided the funding that should have been there in the first place. So this is not a knee-jerk additional funding. It should have been in there already. 
Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, the funding's not unwelcome, um, but we really need to understand the issues around why the funding's being made available. Um, and, and really, it's a matter of, you know, understanding how people feel in spaces a lot of the time, um, because there's a lot around perception of crime as opposed to necessarily actual crime. And of course, public lighting can only address um, activities that happen in the public realm. But on the other hand, if you can encourage people to feel confident and safe to go out into a space, then perhaps more people will follow them. Um, could increase the use of public transport if you feel safe to wait at a bus stop and everything else. And then that can sort of feed on itself because you've got more observers out there. So it could have the potential to reduce crime. But there, there's always a big debate around this area. If, if you're talking about the, the, the effect of lighting on crime itself, not the perception of crime, but actual crime, as you, you might record in national statistics, then there is interesting evidence about this. Perhaps one of the most comprehensive reviews was the, um, I think it was Farrington and Walsh review um, about 10 or so years ago. And they concluded something like, a, a, I think it was about a 20% reduction in crime with improved lighting. So I'm speaking from memory when I give these numbers. So, nice. um, okay. Um, now that was a meta-analysis of previous studies. I think they were all from the UK and the US. Um, I think they found um, mixed quality amongst that research and they, they found mixed results amongst the research, but they concluded overall something like a 20% reduction in crime. Um, they also found a reduction in daytime, a reduction of crime in daytime, which to some extent might be unexpected if we're talking about road lighting. Well, so they attribute yeah. this to the community pride effect, which is if you give attention to an area, um, that will make the local residents feel more positive about their area. They're, they're getting investment from the local authorities. And they think this is an upcoming area and that might lead to more people being out on the streets and in, in enhances natural surveillance. Mm -hmm. Um, there's others. Now, you, you, you mentioned before different results from different studies, and that's not to be um, unexpected. Um, crime is a really difficult one to measure. Um, one of the problems with studies where you relight an area or you improve the lighting is we tend to target areas which have currently got a high crime rate. So you install improved lighting in an area with a high crime rate and the crime goes down. But that may not be only attributable to the lighting. It may be an effect of regression to the mean where things hover about the average. So when it's when we've got a high crime rate, it was naturally going to go down anyway. So we, we need to disentangle effects of lighting from other natural phenomena. That's what I was going to say. The type, I mean, because like the studies that I've seen, it does improve certain elements of crime but not yes. others yes that, that's I've, I've i've been thinking about this question uh, and it depends on why we think lighting might improve uh, or re reduce crime or have an effect on crime um if we think of robbery which is um like a, a violent theft from a person uh for the per for the the victim who was outside at the time road lighting after dark might help because you have more chance of detecting the approaching criminal beforehand, or you've got more chance of yourself or other people identifying that person in, in later, um, in later uh, witness identification tasks. So we might expect lighting to have an effect on reducing robbery, and indeed the evidence I've seen suggests it does. Other crimes, we, we might question, why do we expect lighting to have an effect? And for some, it may do. For others, it doesn't. I, I've just done a recent study using the um, ambient light level approach uh, before and after clock change for the same time of day. And that shows for some crimes, there's a reduction in darkness. For others, there's an increase. Uh, and as part of this work, I've, I've just found a re uh, an, an interesting observation about prostitution. And it suggested prostitution increases with improved road lighting which is against the um 
against the the kind of thoughts of planners and police, I think. And the, the reason for that was suggested to be the prostitutes feel it's safer to work in brighter lighting. The same as would any pedestrian. We, we feel safer generally when lighting is brighter. So we could say the same, there may be the same feeling for people working in prostitution. They feel safer when it's brighter. I think the investment in the area is, is a key point. We've done a number of projects over the years where um, perhaps at the time of considering going into this area and doing the enhancements, uh, landscaping, lighting, etc., we perhaps had a sweepstake of how long the equipment's going to last. And actually, we've been very surprised. Uh, the, the community has taken a pride in the fact that the investment has been made. Um, the benches, the lighting and everything has not suffered adversely uh, as much as it did in the past. Um, same goes for a lot of subways. I uh, did a lot in Stevenage and we had a big problem with some of those um, because we couldn't work out what was wrong. We found the vandals actually dismantling them and wrecking the inside and putting the cover back on because, you know, <laughs> you know it, it was only when the police caught them that we, we tracked down what was going on. But, you know, they, they were... There was a, an investment program in those um, and on approach lighting for them. And we've seen a good increase in the use of the cycleways and, and the footways. And this, this isn't just during the pandemic. This, this is going back a sort of 10 years or so, you know. So um, I think there was certainly, as, as Steve was pointing out, investment in an area brings a lot of like, community pride to it. And, and they then look out for that investment that's been made. That, is, that leads to, I think, really interesting ideas. So mm. You're talking about investment and there you're talking of money. OK, so we're, we're going to install new apparatus in an area. Would we get the same result if we gave the illusion of investment? So as a resident of an area, you, you, will, you might perceive investment, I think, from two thoughts. If there are headlines in your local paper which say were putting extra money into a, a certain area and if you see uh, uh, um, people coming along and fitting you like fittings or something like that so I'm wondering could we get the same effect if we gave the illusion of giving an area attention by something like having a team of workers uh, cleaning the, the, the lampposts or something like that having activity might be sufficient I think actually what you say is quite true because that almost backs up what a lot of the research says that um, it's about changing people's behavior rather than because it's all about perception isn't it from what I can see um, I mean I was going to ask what what has been the most effective way of reducing crime in your in your opinions because given it's dependent on type as well it must be it's quite a mixed bag isn't it I mean there's so many different crimes unfortunately but... I think that's beyond lighting we the most effective way of reducing crime it might be reducing social inequality that's exactly... lighting can't have any effect on rich millionaires keeping money for themselves and voting themselves into power Ooh, yes <laughs> I don't think I can disagree there in fact Alan I I believe that you're working on a project Old Street near yes the... yeah so I did the original scheme for that and mm -hmm. Ponkin Lu architects yeah. Uh, and I remember that that area was a little bit degraded, was a bit maybe run down. And mm. you did make a great change. Everyone seemed to want to go there because it was interesting. And it seemed to give yeah. people a little bit of uh, spring in their step. Now, yeah. the lighting wasn't making them feel safer. It just, it was nice. It, it had a, it was supposed to be like moonlight dappling through trees. Mm -hmm. So people were attracted there. So Maybe the answer is that the lighting should be a broad brush. It shouldn't just be looking at the regulations. It should be looking at what makes us feel better as people. Yeah, I think what you've got to do is you've got to create the right environment that wants to entice people into the <coughs> street and the area. Um, there's an installation off Longacre in, in, in London, and they've done all sorts of interesting lighting down there but people tend to walk past the street look up it and take photos of it and then carry on they, they don't feel enticed into the area whereas um, I went I was in Rotterdam 
couple of years ago for the PLDC conference and I went to see an installation called Broken Light that's fascinated me for a long time and that looks like the, the lights coming through the trees and you see the, the shadows of the leaves etc on the footpath and it's not how you would say as a lighting designer or something look to apply the standards to light the road but actually I felt perfectly safe in that I could recognize people coming up to, towards me and everything and the way it had been done the road was lit properly but the footpaths and everything had this fantastic effect and up on the buildings as well. And I think we can also see the transformation around that's been made in investment around King's Cross. You know, you go down the side of King's Cross now, you've got all that open area. It is so popular with the, the community. People go and sit outside at all hours, etc. Whereas some years ago, it was a, it was a no go area. And that's that again, it, that's that's investment in into those areas and, and lighting whether it's functional lighting or it's just creating a bit of interest, a uh, bit of lighting. And what we did, um, Marble Arch Fountains, uh, a few years ago, they changed it back from being a, a bit, uh, they filled it in to make a garden. They, Westminster turned it back into the fountains. And we hadn't done the rest of the lighting around the area, but people were actually crossing the road and going over to go and have a look because they thought that looks interesting. And, and, and it just brought people into an area where, Effectively, Marble Arch in the centre was to do with a lot of people, uh, homeless people uh, and everything collecting and, and people didn't feel safe to walk through it. They were crossing, crossing the roads instead of using the underpass system, which is dangerous. But these, these things help. I, suppose, I think it is really about, I mean, obviously the best solution is a holistic solution for everyone where we take everything, you can't take things in on their own. Um, so it's interesting to see how the guides obviously are quite they're looking at, at numbers essentially aren't they not not all of the time but quite frequently and if you're if we're looking at us as a, as humanity and how we make our fellow humans feel better with the, each other I mean there is a piece so that if we think about things holistically with, with architects and designers that can only be helpful, can't it? Maybe there's something in the future where that would be part of the guides or something that could could benefit everyone, maybe. It's quite specific, isn't it? That's the problem. I mean, you but mentioned yeah, the project there. They're quite specific to do that everywhere. I mean, Leon is, I find France is, is such a great example of how they use light, not in a fancy way, but just in a way to make you, the environment feel just that little bit better, especially um, Nice and places like that. It's just amazing. You think the investment they've put there is just great. I mean, it makes you feel so at home. Yeah, I think you've got to look at what you need to do. I mean, we're seeing a number of uh, areas, a bit like Westminster now. Westminster City Council have now produced a lighting master plan to look at what they need in the area to stop different theatres competing against each other. How do we, what do we want to create here? These parks are quite dark landscapes and everything else, but you, people want to feel safe going through them. But I think as an industry, we are now moving um, towards a, the right approach of looking at what is the task, what is needed in this area. And the task can change during different times of the night and, and obviously during the daytime as well. And we're looking to apply the right lighting for the task produced by competent professionals. Um, and then we're done to do it as sustainably as possible. Whereas if we go back about 10, 15 years, the money was talking up front and then you're trying to fit a lighting scheme into the fact that we're gonna save energy. Yes, LEDs do save energy, but it, the money was the first part. And we had some really arbitrary decisions on what lighting classes should be applied. You know, so, some local authorities were putting in some really and there was no, you know, we're not quite sure where the lighting professional was in those discussions. What sort of risk assessments taken by? Because everything's driven by risk. There is no requirement to provide lighting, but the local authorities have, a, have can, can provide lighting. And if you do provide it, you should do it properly and you should maintain it and everything. But there, there's, no, there's no legal requirement to do it. But we just got to look at it. We're going to have the right people in part. And I think we are moving forward. And I say we are looking at what is the task, get the right people involved, and then design it as sustainably as possible. Uh, as opposed to, yeah, as I say, 
the finance was talking and get the energy budget down, the energy budget. You know, uh, and this is where perhaps some of these part night installations were um, up for debate as there was sort of more like a blanket approach as opposed to a strategic approach to understand the social dynamics of certain areas. You know, um, I certainly noticed when my my daughter was younger that instead of coming in at two o'clock when we hit part night in where I live, she was in by midnight. Um, it feels to me, Alan, this, it's, a, it's a really complex equation. You're trying to provide lighting for different groups of people with different needs. Mm. Um, that, that's maybe the, the benefits of lighting. You've got the costs, which are the perhaps installation in the first place. You have the energy consumption. You have uh, consideration of the ecology. You've got consideration of light pollution. That is an awful lot of considerations. Some of those might be unique to each individual area. How do you go about doing that? And is it always done for every area? I think, I think almost every scheme we do now has bats involved. Um, we said, and, and also we've got the ongoing discussion about what happens with aging people's eyesight and everything. But I think a lot of the projects we're working on now, we are sitting there in, in, in a balance and certainly fauna and flora issues are to the fore. Um, uh, um, as, as Christopher said earlier, you know, we get involved in these working groups and I'm working with the, on the ILP technical panel with the Bat Conservation Trust, looking at how we can apply the task lighting we need, but look after bats and another fauna and flora. Um, and sky glow and obtrusive light is very much an issue to the fore as well. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it, 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 it is a complex juggling balancing act to do, mm. which is why really it's a matter of having the right team and the right competent people involved in that to advise and look at the different areas. Mm. Um, I'm fortunate that we have a very good team in WSP that understand bats and wildlife, but, um, and things, in, I, I really managed to work better when I've discovered they existed and that we now work together to, to understand the right thing, as opposed to, I suppose, I'm, I'm second guessing something on yeah. an area where I have an understanding, but I'm not a fully competent person and, and vice versa with them when it comes to the application of artificial light. I think it's, it's certainly not simple. I mean, to wrap up the, for the original question, I think for me it's about taking a holistic view and getting all parties involved. Mm. That would be my that would be my conclusion because it's not it's not a tick box mentality. We're humans, so we're all different, but really we should look at it in a holistic view. That would be my summarization, if I can put mm. it like that. I'm going to add something. Go for it. To make, to make sure um, I, I don't sell things short. Um, the thing I look at is uh, evidence of the benefits of lighting for people. And I focus on pedestrians and cyclists. And I do that for two reasons. There's at first, because um, when I see numbers in guides, I like to make sure they have a basis rather than guesswork. Um, secondly, because cyclists and pedestrians were underrepresented when I started. Most research, most lighting research seemed to be about drivers. We kind of ignored pedestrians and cyclists. Mm -hmm. And there are other groups that we should consider as well. Um, what we try and do, we, we look at each task associated with a pedestrian and try to question what happens if we change the lighting? Is there a benefit to increasing the light level? And the point of that is to say, do we recommend the right light levels at the minute? Um, at the minute, I'm not quite, I'm not sure that we do. Maybe the light levels we, we currently rec recommend are about right. To some extent, that might be chance rather than um, rather than uh, having a strong basis in, in, in empirical evidence. Um, and I think we need to know, we need to better understand what happened about the benefits of lighting so that when you're faced with pressure to um, reduce the lighting to save energy, or reduce the lighting to reduce obtrusive glow or, or reduce ecological impact. We need to know what happens to those benefits for pedestrian and cyclists, because we know the more light, 
the more people walk and cycle, and we want more people walking and cycling because that's one of our uh, national objectives, I think, to have more active travel. And we know that if pe more people are walking and cycling, that's more eyes on the street. That is probably better for crime and safety overall. Okay, that's that makes complete sense. And let's hope that the government takes note of all these elements. <laughs> Although I very much cannot <laughs> uh, I have no faith in Boris Johnson at all. <laughs> well, or what can you say? What can you say about him other than he would make you you'd you'd he'd be great at having a party, but you wouldn't let him drive you home. That's all I can say. Certainly not. <laughs> all right. So thanks very much for your time. Um, thanks, Chris. Thank don't you. Don't forget to uh, like and share this if you like what you saw. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll see you next time. Ta yeah. No, thank you very much. I'll see you around, Steve. All right. Thank you, Chris. Definitely. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Following our podcast, this recent CPD event from the ILP addresses the role of public lighting in designing safer places, which is a perfect way to round off this topic. Featuring the current ILP president, Fiona Horgan, Senior Vice President, Rebecca Hatch, and with presenters, Dr. Jemima Unwin and Professor Peter Raynham, it's a veritable goldmine of knowledge. So put on a brief, just let the knowledge flow as these opportunities don't come along that often. Hello and welcome to our CPD event, the role of public lighting in designer safe, safer spaces. For this, we would like to really give a big welcome to Dr. Jemima Unwin and Professor Peter Raynham. They are both from the University College London and the Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering. Thank you ever so much and I hope everybody enjoys this event. Well, good afternoon and thank you for inviting us to speak today. Um, what I what we will be trying to cover is some of the complicated issues that we get with lighting, safety and perceptions of safety. Um, I think between myself and Jemima and when we've spent probably 30 to 40 years worrying about this sort of problem. And I don't think we have any clear cut 100% answers but perhaps we at least understand the problem a little bit more. So I'm going to run through. I would be going through the first half dozen or so slides. Then Jemima will pick up from there. And at the end, I will conclude. So moving on. The problem of public lighting space and perception of space is the what happens in reality and what people expect to happen are two very different things. And so I'm going to be looking at safety and perception of safety. And we'll look at the demographics associated with those perceptions. We'll think about the role, time, place, culture and client and so on. And we'll think about does that, does darkness have a role? And perhaps if darkness has a role, perhaps lighting should be part of the solution, but it's not as clear cut and simple as I'm sure we would all like it to be. So I'm going to start to illustrate this problem by going over uh, some really old data that we did at quite a big survey, probably 15 years ago, maybe slightly longer. And we asked questions of just over 3,000 people in various town centres, they're ranging, I think we went as far south as Sutton Coldfield and as north as Rotherham. So um, gives you a range of where we were working. And the results of this are, as with any social science sort of survey, they're up for debate because the way you ask questions actually influences the answer. So life's a little bit complicated. So please don't draw out too much detail from these results, but perhaps they give you an indication of what's going on. So of these 3000 odd people we interviewed, 
we found that 184 of them had been victims of crime in the areas that we were questioning them about. So that's about 6% of the sample. We then asked, had they known anybody who'd been a victim of crime? And we found that 729 people knew people who were victims. And so that's about 24% of our sample. So um, obviously word of mouth about crime on site spreads quite well. That would suggest approximately, um, you know, about four times the number of actual crimes. So if you're a victim of crime, on average, you probably tell four people. And then we asked the question, do you feel safe or unsafe at night? And people re responding that they felt at least to some degree unsafe in the areas at night, we had 963, about 31% of the sample. And then asked, would you go to the site at night? And those who would not visit that site were just over 1,200, almost 40% of people wouldn't actually go out at night, or if they did, would go only very infrequently. Now, because these numbers were quite large, um, you know, having 3,000 interviews, um, we can now start to break out those by demographic. Now, the important thing to think about when you're looking at this demographic is that for everybody who has been a victim of crime or something, they're 100% a victim of crime. So because we see between 16 to 19, only 14% or 15% of people have been victims of crime, for those people who have been victims of crime, that's a big issue. However, th there's no sort of concept that somebody's been a 15% victim of crime. So, Having got that bit over, it's clear that men are slightly more likely to be victims of crime than women. And the younger age groups uh, tend to be more victims of crime than older age groups. There's a slight anomaly in women over 65. And we think that was when we look back at the results and data, we found that we actually included in that data three women who had actually tripped over paving stones into that area. So um, broadly speaking, crime is a problem for younger people um, and it's slightly more a problem for men than it is for women. Now, when we ask questions about fear of crime, the first thing that pops out is that more women feel much more unsafe more unsafe than men. Um, it's about two to one in most age groups on average, except as we get towards the older age groups where men start to worry more uh, and feel less safe. But certainly this is a real issue among younger women that uh, they feel more unsafe in the public at night. And then when we look at people who just try not to go out at night, then we get this sort of graph, which shows us that the older you get, the much less likely you are to go out at night, and, and women are less likely to go out than men. Now, we can't put all of this down to crime or fear of crime, although that's probably an element in it. There are all sorts of other issues going on here. For example, um, a lot of the nighttime activities are associated with the sale of alcohol. And perhaps as you get older, you tend to go out down the pub less. And maybe going down the pub is a slightly male dominated activity. So women tend to go out less and so on. So there's a lot of complexity here. The other level of complexity is in any of these responses, you're conditioned by a whole variety of factors. And these factors vary uh, enormously um, depending on a lot of conditions. So, for example, on one of the sites we were working on, um, three days before we did the survey, this newspaper headline turned up to describe the site. And as you can imagine, that's probably going to make quite a big difference to the way people responded to um, 
our questions on the site as to whether they were worried and had fear of crime. A headline like that's not going to help, is it? But yet, perhaps we as lighters are also influenced by what we read. And we here we see a couple of advertisements out there, but we as lighters feel immediately that if there's a problem, then lighting is a good way to solve it. It's one of these situations where if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, all problems are going to start to look like nails fairly quickly. So I think we'll come to the view that lighting probably has a problem, but it's much more complicated than this, as Jemima's going to explain when she discusses some of her work. Hello, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, thank you to the ILP for the invite. Um, so I started looking at this area about 10 years ago, um, and it was just really interesting that the more I read, uh, the more I found uh, contradictory information at every turn. For example, the Chicago Valley Lighting Project found that uh, reported crime increased post lighting installation. Uh, because people could see what was going on and therefore report it. So I was like, okay, well, that's obviously no good. You know, uh, that's not true, is it? You know, we, don't, we would like to think that lighting doesn't um, increase crime, but because of the way it was reported, um, it seemed that it did. Um, also, there were issues, I think this, I actually read this in the ILP journal, It were in the lighting journal, there was an article about how, um, oh, if you have, um, you know, people go and uh, they find a brightly lit area at night, they automatically think, oh, you know, it must be for the CCTV, what's happened here, it must be dodgy around here. Um, I also uh, had a few discussions with social scientists who told me, oh, fear of crime, oh, it's just all invented, it was politically motivated by the Americans in the uh, 1960s to, you know, in response to uh, riots. So. Um, then, then I had, on the other hand, anecdotal information from just just anecdotal, so not yet scientific data, but it can sow the seed of an idea where people were telling me, oh yeah, whenever I am walking at night, if it's scary or too dark, I just run up the street, <laughs> or, or you know, people who were genuinely like, you know, of course, fearing is, of course, uh, perceives, of course, I don't feel safe going out at night. So I had, um, from all this reading, I had a, a lot of contradictory information, and I thought, oh, I, I really want to get to the bottom of this. So I planned a two part study um, and the aim of the first one was to just talk to people about where they were confident and not confident walking at night. My aim was not to put words in people's mouth. You know, obviously, if you ask somebody, does lighting increase your perceived safety? They'll just say yes. So it's not helpful in terms of a survey because, you know, they you know they want their street to have new street lighting. So they'll just say that. And, you know, it just seems like a sensible thing to say. Um, so what I was doing was just um, interviewing uh, if, for this study, this part of the study, 53 people, and I asked them take photos where you feel confident walking alone at night and not confident walking alone at night. And then let's come in for an interview and let's talk about them. And I didn't mention lighting, I didn't know I was studying lighting, nothing mentioned lighting in the in the sheets, they, in the, all the sheets I had to hand out. You might notice why some of those streets photos are taken in daylight, I had to give people that option because it was unethical to not give them the option to take pictures in, in daylight. So you can see from the left, so these are some examples on this side, the next one of um, photos that people provided. And you can see on the left hand side, they're uh, residential streets, they're wide, they were usually familiar. Um, for example, the bottom left picture there, you know, you might not, if you didn't know the street, you might not like using it, it seems narrow, wood on one side, but actually if you lived there, it was absolutely fine. And on the right hand side, you can see an underpass, um, a wood, uh, area of Sheffield um, behind a leisure centre called Palms Forge on the top there, which I see on the top right got very dark at night and uh, no one used it. There were some slippy steps and there's a big wall and just altogether felt unsafe. So this is what I was finding was that people, um, this was a type of photos that were coming back and, and it seemed that, you know, on a on the local street, people generally weren't worried. People also spoke a lot about um, guardianship. So oh, it's a type of area where people, um, you know, who are around, would, would they be the type of person who would help me should I get into trouble? 
this goes back to the ideas of Jane Jacobs. Uh, she had this idea called Eyes on the Streets, where people were considered to be a safety asset after dark. Um, so because they seemed that other people in the environment were really what mattered. And, um, and that's obvious, isn't it? I mean, obviously the environment itself can't really hurt us. There's uh, very few um, obstacles that are big enough to trip us. And um, it's it's really the, um, you know, we're interested in other people, but are they, you know, going to harm us or not? So what we're interested in, in is surveying a street is that are there people there, yes or no, and inferring whether they would hurt us or not. Um, I'm going hop to hop over to the next slide. So, sorry about this, my um, uh, mouse is a bit slow. So the, here's some more photos. So again, pretty much the same again. Um, and what I found was what seemed to be really important was an idea, again, quite an old idea of prospect refuge theory. So if people had a good view, a, a good open view of what was ahead, and that there was also the idea of refuge, um, you know, somewhere you could where you'd go, how do you go in if, um, you know, if, somebody, if, if someone would attack you? Now, the interesting thing about that is that those um, safe places, so for example, a house uh, that's a safe place could also have a hedge behind which someone could hide, and that could be a hiding place for someone who is also up to no good. So these ideas did have contradictions in them. So it, it, it was really hard. I kind of got, got all these interesting answers. Oh, next slide. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm. Um, I think Peter and I are both controlling it. <laughs> right. So next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So, so here you can see on the previous slide. Um, see that the presence of other people. All, all these. These were the issues everybody spoke about, and all sorts of factors had a part to play. Um, so when you spoke, so people did mention lighting, so without having the words put in their mouths, people were talking about, in, in example, the, for the familiar safe places on the right, they were talking about access to help, road lighting, spatial features, not a dodgy area, but lighting was always mentioned in interaction with other people, with, with other things. It was never mentioned on its own. And likewise, for the non-reassuring uh, uh, areas, people were mentioning other things along with lighting. It was, it was never a, a factor on its own. So I so you kind of get stuck on the research, like, OK, what, what do I do? I I know this now, that's fantastic, but how do I, you know, make sense of all this information? Because obviously it's very diff uh, almost silly to compare, you know, streets that are very different to each other with um, different, you know, or lots of other variables, for example, who, who else is around, um, you know, whether it's residential or not. Anyway, um, one chap had a really good go at this, and um, that's Peter Boyce. Peter Boyce wrote this paper here, um, reference at the bottom. He came up with the idea of a day minus night safety rating. So um, what this was, he, he went around car parks in um, Albany and New York State and and sorry, New York City, both of which are in New York State. And he um, got people to rate the area during the day and at night, deducted one from the other. And that was the, and he interpreted that as being the effect that lighting had on the environment, because that was the only thing which changed between night and day in terms of the physical features of the environment. Um, so you can see here there's there's a curve. Um, it does seem that lighting has an, it has an impact because it slopes downwards. So the higher the median luminance, the lower the day minus night safety rating. Um, so this so this was quite this is quite a clever way of um, controlling for um, different environments. So for example, on this side, you've got very different environments and how on earth uh, do we differentiate one from the other? You know, the, the one on the bottom left, you might think no one in the right mind will go there, but if you're the only person living there and you know it's safe, then that's great.
Um, okay. So uh, what, what he did, I'm so sorry my slides are jumping around. Um, I'm not sure if the timing's been taken off them all. Um, anyway, so here, so what he did was he um, wanted to look at um, the effect of, so uh, compare one street to another. So you can see here the street on the right there is the daytime street, the street on the left um, is the nighttime street, and you get a safety rate, a rating for one, a safety rating for the other, you deduct one from the other. And uh, so like all good scientific studies, Peter Boyce wrote this up in a way which was repeatable. So here's a, so I had a, a, a good chance to repeat this using residential streets in Sheffield. And you can see here a whole variety of um, street, the, a selection of the streets I used. Um, so you, residential streets at higher and lower density in the middle at the bottom, uh, uh, industrial area. And what I was looking at was um, uh, well, what people thought, what, how they perceived, uh, whether they perceived it to be safe or not at day and night, and we used the same method to deduct one from the other and then plotted them against various lighting metrics. So people walked those routes there shown with, with the blue blue dash line um, and, in, and um, stopped at the point where the little arrow was and filled in a survey. So quite a simple method. So just a quick refresh, because I know this is for some people it's a bit fiddly. So the on the left hand side there, these bars, the the, the day and the night safety rating are plotted here. So if you see these, I added my data points to Peter's and you can see that they're following the same pattern. Um, the higher the median illuminance, the lower the, uh, the day minus night safety rating. So it seems like lighting is having an effect um, on people's uh, perceived safety. And you can see a clump of streets here, a clump of streets here, and because they're, they're clustered like that, we, we can say, OK, well, something's going on. What is it about these streets which makes people change their rating between day and night? Um, so I then went on to plot these against various uh, lighting metrics. And what I found was that uh, lighting did matter. Um, it seemed that people were particularly interested in vertical illuminance. So on environments with higher vertical illuminance, um, the day minus night safety rating was lower. And also the length of dark areas in the environment um, that seemed to have the highest correlation. I'm not saying correlation means causation, but it seemed that what we don't like is long dark patches, in this case of less than one look, so pretty dark, um, and definitely no more than 10 metres in the environment. So that's what really seemed to um, affect people's judgments and um, using this method. So now why is this? I mean, I, I you know, it's in a way it's anyone's guess, but this is probably what it's to do with. This is the um, idea that the street turns into lurk lines behind which people can hide after dark. So this, the, these um, ideas of were, you know, they're old, it's in the 1980s by a chap called War. And he um, talked about this idea that basically what we're worried about is uh, what can jump out of us. So it's not what we what we can see or what we it's what we imagine we can't see. You know, in the kind of, I think this probably comes back to some primeval uh, fear of things jumping out in the dark, you know, the unknown. I suppose that is. So um, that so that was um, quite a lot of work to find out that. <laughs> And also, it's not quite that simple again. I mean, I, I hate, you know, as a researcher, you always come out with more questions than answers every time. And so people say that's just to justify your existence. <laughs> but uh, we have this thing that we're still in this study where we really carefully try to control um, one one with the, you know, this have this clever method that Peter Boyce came up with. It was still not that simple. So, for example, you can see here on, on the right hand side on this chart, I had these, I had five groups. They're the, the five uh, pairs of data points there. Um, one limitation was, of course, that they were doing the survey as a group and nobody goes around the streets in large groups like that unless they're doing surveys, usually. Um, another one is that for group two here, which had the, the lowest mean day minus night safety rating, it had some lo local teenagers um, turned up um, accidentally, <laughs> accidentally, uh, and um, yeah, and my group got a bit scared. Um, 
so that obviously so it seems to have impacted um well a few individuals in the group may have overreacted <laughs> to that so that affected the mean score um likewise age i mean we had i did have old uh, one older group and the, the rest were student groups and in this group of over 65 uh, people uh, were um, giving lower on average lower ratings during the day as well as at night and that could could just be that they're more willing to admit the fear. I mean, it's, it's also a limitation in the survey uh, method. You know, some people are more willing to admit things than others. Um, it, you could say that women are more willing to admit their fear to men than men, and then that would explain um, Peter's findings earlier. Um, and then at a time of day also seemed to have an effect. So there's one group I did later and they had a, a big gap here too. So again, you know, not that simple. Um, but what does seem to matter again is other people. <laughs> a recurring theme is what we seem to care about is other people in the environment. Now that in terms of lighting use, OK, it could translate to vertical illuminance. Or is it, you know, are we interested in seeing just seeing who's there from a distance? And is it is it people silhouettes we're more interested in? But, you know, like, for example, the slide on the right here, um, that's a, a bridge a bridge in London. I'm sure some of you recognize it. It's busy. None of us would have any problem walking across that at night, um, probably because of the, you know, what we're inferring about people, other people walking across it. Um, but, you, but you see there, we can't really see the people very well at all. We can barely see their faces. So we'd be happier to walk there than the photo on the left, um, where there's a, a jogger uh, walking at, alone at night, uh, running alone at night. So, oops, I've jumped again. So. I think this is my general conclusion is that lighting should convey enough information to make a judgment about what to do in the environment. Um, yeah, and that's so we needed to enough lighting to see and to make a judgment about whether to use a street or not. And I think that's what lighting designers um, uh, should be aiming at. But that's uh, by all means not good lighting design. That's kind of just avoiding these um, dark patches which seem to bother people. And I am going to hand back to Peter now and I uh, apologise for my slides uh, jumping about. OK, thank you. I'm sorry, Peter, you're on mute. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. So. I'm going to try and bring this to a close by thinking about some of the points Jemima has raised there and what they mean in terms of practice for doing lighting. So if you have a job to do lighting tomorrow, how are you going to use this sort of information to inform what you do? And the first thing to note is that what we've been through these worries of safety or lack of safety and fear of using our streets at night are real problems. And the demographics which uh, are associated with them, particularly with older people and with women, are perhaps some interesting problems in the demographic of street use at night. And from a social point of view, we have to think is this something that we can practically achieve to even out our street use at night? Now, this sort of decision as to how much effort to go into that is probably well above the pay grade of the average lighting designer. These are real major political issues for our society to solve. But at the margins, we can start to make things better. And probably the bulk of the problem are associated with bad lighting. And so the first obvious step to take is actually if you're lighting, think about what people are going to want and use as a basic guideline to start off with some of the quite good guides that are already out there. So I guess most people who are designing public lighting would start with BS 5489 part one. And there's buckets of good advice in there. and if you follow what that standard says, you might not produce good lighting, but at least you won't get bad lighting. Then beyond that, then you have to think, what do you want to create on a particular street? 
do you want um, to provide lighting for movement? So lighting so people can find their way, lighting that's comfortable and perhaps providing reassurance and boosting city images and so on. So all of these can be readily achieved if you think provided you know what you want to do, you can do them. There are masses of problems associated with the social side of this, and particularly if we think how we want our streets to be used at night. So a small residential road, perhaps you're only thinking about providing lighting that gets people into and out of their homes safely. But as you get up the scale into towards more town centres, then are you actually trying to make these roads a social space? or are you trying to just make them thoroughfares or whatever? So a sense of purpose for what your road is wanting to do. But the bottom line to all of this is lighting alone is unlikely to be the full solution. Yes, if you have um, a rundown area with lots of hidey holes where people can hide away from the light and a geometry that doesn't lend itself to good sight lines, then as a lighting engineer, you're probably a limited in what you're going to do. So you will have to be part of a team working to improve an area. You can't do it all alone as a lighter. At which point I'd like to move on and say, um, that about wraps it up for what we want to say. We're going to now ask a few questions, answer a few questions. Hopefully Rebecca's got a nice long list to give us. And if you think about this later, then this presentation will be handed out. And if you've got any questions, here are our email addresses. Please get hold of us later and we'll do our best to answer you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jemima. Really interesting presentation. And I'm sure everybody that's joined us here, whether you're still here from the AGM or you've just joined us for the CPD, found that really interesting and informative. We have got some questions for you. Um, so to kick off, um, first question is that the day minus night safety rating is really interesting. Do you think this should be more well known about? Um, should it maybe be considered for uh, integration into one of our standards. Would you like to start on that and I'll pick up the point about standards later on, Jemima? Um, yeah, all right. So, yeah, I, I think um, would I integrate it in the standards? Uh, probably not, but I definitely think it's a, a good approach. Um, yeah, because it, it does its best to control for different environments. So I think it would be great if researchers in this area used it more because when I have look, been reading recently, I've looked at all sorts of studies, um, as particularly lighting and crime. And um, what I've found is that people don't really, they, they never look at, they never compare the day to night. So they just look at different areas at night and then you don't, you don't know what else is going on in those areas. So it's very hard to come up with any any real conclusion uh, because of all the variables. So I would say, yeah, it's, it, was, I, it, it would be fantastic to see it used more um, even outside the field of lighting. Um, yeah, and I'll pass on to Peter about the standards. Yeah, I don't think this is really uh, a tool that is appropriate for standards. It is a very nice way of doing, if you like, a post installation assessment. So it's a, it's a nice tool for research. It's a nice tool for assessing the quality of your design, but it's not really an, an element that will form part of a specification. OK, thank you. Thank you both. Um, another question is, did any of the work of the research that you did take place in smaller towns or less urban environments, as there's obviously a big difference between city centres and uh, rural environments in terms of how they're generally perceived by by the users? OK, so I will start off on that. We used two 
fairly large towns and one small one. We did part of our study in a small, I guess it's a not that smaller community as part of the borough of Rotherham, a place called Swinton. Um, so I guess there's a few thousand people there, not hundreds of thousands. Then the other main parts of the survey were done in um, Litchfield and Sutton Coalfield. So gives you an idea of the scale of places. I guess you can hang that. It's never going to be possible to generalise across all these sorts of environments. And Jemima, I think all of your work was in Sheffield, wasn't that? Yeah, so it was uh, in uh, residential areas in Sheffield. They were quite different areas. Um, one was um, known to be, well, some people thought it was a bit of a rough area. O other areas were, um, it, it seemed to be less rough. So yeah, yeah, it was a, a range of areas, all residential. I didn't do any urban centres. Um, and I didn't do any completely rural areas either. Um, yeah, but I completely agree they're perceived very differently and therefore the expectations of lighting are completely different. So, you know, you would, we, you know, it's like um, Peter said, you know, you, um, this idea that if you if you have a hammer, everything looks like, you know, what, what we don't want to do is say, you know, the magic number is 3.7 lux on this surface or that, and then apply it to all environments because it, you know, lighting design doesn't work like that. And I'd like to sort of go over and just classifying towns by their size is probably not an appropriate way into this problem either. Um, in fact, there's a whole discipline that we work with called space syntax, which talks about the geometry of streets and the interconnectedness of roads and thoroughfares in towns. And OK, without a boring you all silly, and spending three hours going into the principles of it. The way we think about urban space is incredibly complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, other questions, we've still got time for some more. Um, it was mentioned during the presentation, the, you know, the importance of vertical illuminance um, and whether or not there's anything to add regarding how we uh, review our schemes, as you said, sort of post installation, you know, by adding uh, vertical grids um, and where those grids should be placed. I think the, the guidance around vertical illumination is maybe still a little bit lack, lacking compared to some of our other uh, better understood um, assessments that we do. So, yeah, just, just a bit more on the vertical illuminance side, if you can. Shall I start with that and then you contribute a bit later on, Jemima? Sure. OK, so. As I understand it, the, the critical thing is to pick up the vertical illuminance measures that we've already got um, defined, and they come from EN 13201 part two, and, th and the definitions are actually implicit in part three. So they seem to work, and I'm fairly sure that's the definition that Jemima used in her study. Now, the, the real problem that we're trying to address here is the way we perceive objects on our road at night and a simple metric like vertical illuminance is always just going to be a first approximation to it. Um, we've also come across real problems in the way that we can find objects on the road at night because at low contrast, peripheral vision doesn't seem to function properly. Uh, and so there's another whole host of interesting problems. So from Jemima's study, we know that vertical illuminance seems to be an important factor. It seemed to find similar findings from a whole range of studies, so it's not surprising. Um, and despite the weaknesses in 1.3, 032 part one series of standards. What they're proposing is moderately sensible. So I think from a practical point of view, that's where I would start. Is that how you would foresee it, Jemima? Yeah, and just I'll just add one thing there, which is that I think uh, vertical surfaces are quite important. So there are a few ideas about enclosure, entrapment, wanting to see escape routes wanting to perceive our kind of spatial boundary, which is 
it, it's almost like a you know the street's like a huge outdoor room isn't it and we kind of instinctively want to know what the extent of that is and how we go through it and how we get out of it if we need to so i think um uh, you know but things like lighting building facades now obviously that's easier in town centers than on residential streets but i think um yeah that's the one thing i would add to that but yeah i agree with peter yeah and i'll just add one point to that is it's often interesting in uh, looking at what people can and can't see so if we have a fence line of, of fence line of people's front gardens down a road and they're all painted black they're going to be quite a bit harder to see that definition of the boundary compared to if they were all painted white and the other way yeah yeah, so in many situations, a bucket of white paint is more useful than extra, extra street paint. <laughs> Don't tell everyone that, Peter. <laughs> You're doing us no. out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so I think just last question um, was whether there was um, uh, consideration for glare as part of the assessments that you did. Yeah, so it, this is an interesting question because I, I did ask people to um, rate all sorts on the street. So it was like, you know, a, a page survey um, and I had glare as, you know, what do you think the glare's like on the street or on one of the questions? That, and that was the one which I think people just didn't understand the question. Um, I people just didn't know what it meant. Um, so I got absolutely no results from that at all. It was just had nothing to do with anything I was looking at. Um, now, I, I suspect the streets um, were not very glary. Um, it was pre-LED, this study. Um, but still, I think there's an issue of, well, in the survey approach of how, you know, we communicate to people what glare actually is so that they know that I think that I should have probably done that a bit better so that people would have known what I was talking about. In terms of objective uh, measurements of glare, I didn't do any. Um, I know Peter's um, quite critical of the objective measurements, so <laughs> maybe I'll hand over to Peter now. OK, so glare, as we know, gives us two problems. First of all, we lose vision from disability glare and it might be uncomfortable on the streets. Now, since the introduction of LEDs, we definitely have gone into a situation where discomfort glare is on residential roads is significantly worse than it used to be. And my feeling is that that can only act in one way, and that is if the experience of using the roads at night is less comfortable, then the likelihood of people using those roads is going to decrease. Now, I've got no evidence whatsoever to back that up, but that's the, the logical pathway. Now, a lot of the fear of crime issues are about lack of people around to support you. So if you're in a crowded road and there's eight or nine different people you can see, that gives you a feeling of safety. If you do anything to reduce those numbers of people there, then potentially it has the possibility to reduce the perception of safety. OK. OK, thank you, Peter. Um, I think sort of along the same lines, you know, talking about glare, unwanted light. Um, another question here about spill light that's perhaps impacting on the actual uh, intended road lighting, you know, coming from buildings, private areas that you know, the lighting designer has no control over um, because perhaps they were already existing, you know, historic lighting that then is having an effect on the designed road lighting. Is there any any thoughts on that? I, mean, I think that definitely affects perceived safety. If people can see a light on in the window or see, you know, a, a, even a shop light left on at ground level it is comforting to them. Um, so it's interesting that that kind of wasted light in a way, um, it could be seen as um, helping um, for reassurance. But as as the um, as you mentioned in your question, we can't, you know, say everyone in the house leave their lights on although interestingly um i think it was in i think it was in uh, don't quote me on something like 1558 where when a law was passed that people um i guess who lived on corners should should light a lantern um during the christmas period <laughs> so so that people have legislated for that in the past but yeah obviously that is not going to happen now um yeah so def so definitely it affects um perceived safety um 
uh, but I don't think it can ever affect what we do with the with the road lighting because we can't ever say you know we can't we don't we it's uncontrollable um, as I'm sure the person who asked the questions aware. Yeah, it definitely can be a useful item. The real issue here is if you can see a window that's lit at the end of the street, then you know, even if you can't see the people in the street, you know that there's nobody between you and that window because otherwise your view, your distant view would be blocked. And so these distant views of lights are really good at providing reassurance. So um, I think this is a case where we want to promote spill light. It's one of the few cases for it, but it, it is amazing how much just relatively low luminances of objects in the distance can help. And because you can see something in the distance, then you know you've got a clear path to that object. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that makes perfect sense. Um, we'll try getting promote. We'll try going back to the to the 1950s then. Getting those lights That's on the it. corners. Um, great. Um, one one from me, and actually I think it has cropped up in the Q and A. Was just, are you planning to continue your research? You know, is this going to be broaden the number of participants? Maybe the types of area that you're you're testing this theory on? Oh, oh yes, definitely. Um, I am um, yeah hoping to. Uh, well, I'm uh, writing a research proposal at the moment. So I'm just looking in the question box there and I can see one question which says, can you comment on the fact that perceptions may differ from the actual fact of safety? And that's something I, I want to look at in um, more detail. So yeah, hopefully to be continued. <laughs> in a, give, just give me, your yeah, research is slow, so give me like a year <laughs> or two. <laughs> okay, yeah. so we'll have to have you come back to, to give us the update. <laughs> yeah. well, that'll be a pleasure. Great. I, I think we're we're probably about there with the questions. Everyone's uh, everyone's exhausted their their thoughts there. Obviously, such a such an interesting presentation. I think we uh, we, we covered a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people's thoughts as you went through. So um, thank you both for for doing this for us today. Um, it's really interesting topic, and we'll definitely all be uh, looking forward to the next update so that we can see how it progresses. Um, and the, as usual, the event recording will be shared on the website along with any of the questions and answers. And if there has been any questions that we haven't covered, um, then hopefully uh, Jemima and Peter, you wouldn't mind answering those for us and we can add those to the website. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, that's included in the, the emails that go out to all the members that have attended. Um, and thank you for everyone that's joined us. Um, as I said earlier, whether you have been here since since the AGM or whether you joined us for the CPD, thank you. Um, and what is happening next? Well, besides the sharing of this fantastic event from today, we've also got the highlights uh, session on the 28th of June, which for those that haven't attended one before, it's a very informal uh, networking event. We can drop in and out as, in, as and when you choose to. Um, but this is one that's got a special focus on the 28th, which is meeting the president team so Fiona myself and as many as the exec board will be attending that highlight session so please join us and we also have a fantastic presentation lined up by the LDC Manchester on the 13th of July which is discussing human centred lighting so if you haven't already register for that on the ILP website but thank you everyone and look forward to seeing you all soon